Number 10, the Hulk. Now, Bruce Banner is the absolute poster child for not being able to control one's powers. If you're not familiar with the immense power this genius possesses, where have you been? Due to exposure to gamma radiation from the gamma bomb that he designed, he now has the ability to turn into the green giant known as the Hulk, with many of the early transformations being involuntary due to anger. Well, he does eventually strike an agreement with the Beast Within. An excellent example of that being the Hulk-Bruce hybrid we see on screen in Avengers Endgame, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Now, how much control Bruce winds up losing to the Hulk is best described as a spectrum because there are times when he completely loses himself to the Hulk-fueled rage, there are times when he retains his genius intellect, and there are instances of everything in between, really. First appearing in The Incredible Hulk number 1 all the way back in 1962, the Hulk is a staple in comic book history, and I really hope one day he just gets a decent standalone movie. Number 9. Black Bolt. Now, the king of, in of the Inhumans is a bit of a tricky one since he does have some control over his powers, he's just severely handicapped by them. Black Bolt's powers come from an organic brain implant that interacts with electrons in the air, and this implant is connected to the speech center of his brain. Now, similar to how Cyclops' powers is activated when he opens his eyes, Black Bolt's ability is activated whenever he speaks, no matter how loud he is, which leaves him effectively mute outside of battle. This has led to some major mishaps for the hero, like the time he accidentally killed his parents with the debris of a Kree ship he destroyed with his voice, or the time he fought Thanos and destroyed Attilan, which led to the release of a Terrigan mist bomb that combined with the atmosphere, became deadly to mutants everywhere. So, although he does have control over his voice, that doesn't mean that he's able to control the sheer power of his abilities. Check him out in his first appearance, Fantastic Four, number 45 in 1965. Number 8, Citizen Steel. DC Comics' Nathan Haywood had a promising football career until a severe injury required him to have one of his legs amputated. Following an attack by the fourth rake, this was meant to wipe out the entire Haywood bloodline. Nathan was infected by the metal blood that came from one of those foes, and for reasons that were never really explained, Nathan's body absorbed the metal, and in addition to him growing back a new leg, it made him a superhuman. With his newfound super strength and invincibility, Haywood fights crime under the name Citizen Steel. However, there are aspects of his power that are completely out of his control. Because of his steel-like skin, he's completely lost the ability to feel physical touch, which prevents him from gauging temperature or pain, and he can't control how strong he is, and I mean at all. There are times where his footsteps will be so heavy and powerful that the floor will break underneath him. To try and counteract this, he wears a special suit that mitigates his movements, but it can really only do so much. First appearing in Justice Society of America, Volume 3, Number 2, back in 2007. Check him out to see how truly strong he can be. Number 7. Scarlet Witch. The twin sister of Pietro Maximoff, Wanda Maximoff has always had trouble keeping her powers under control. With the ability to manipulate and warp reality at will with a force she refers to as chaos magic, which was given to her by high evolutionary's experimentation and then further amplified by the demon that was imprisoned in Wondergore Mountain, her powers are really easy to lose control of, especially when her emotions are out of control. A 2004 storyline is a great example of this when she discovered that her twin sons weren't real. They were actually just manifestations of her reality altering chaos magic, and she was unable to accept this and soon became a danger to herself and others, so her memories of the boys were completely wiped from her memory. Years later, she began to remember them, and when she realized what had been done to her, she went completely mad with grief. Her nervous breakdown gave way to a full-on war waged against the Avengers that resulted in several deaths, and the team's complete upheaval and all the destruction and death came from her tampering with the fabric of reality. Later on, she causes M-Day, the depowering of the mutant race that nearly caused their extinction. Moral of the story? You really don't want to get on her bad side because you have no idea what she's going to do. Check her out for yourself on the big screen in all the Avengers movies or in her first appearance, 1964's X-Men number 4. Number 10, Gambit. Remy LeBeau is a powerful and popular member of the X-Men with the ability to tap into an item's potential kinetic energy, making it a dangerous and explosive weapon. He often uses smaller items like a deck of playing cards, which he will then throw at his enemies. The only real limit on these powers is that he needs to make direct skin contact with whatever item he's charging, hence the cool fingerless gloves, and the amount of time it takes him to charge the object, with larger objects taking longer. He also has the ability to hypnotically charm people, making them more likely to do what he wants. Before he was a member of the X-Men though, he was a master thief, but he found that he was having trouble controlling his powers, and was worried that he might potentially harm other people. This caused him to seek out the help of Mr. Sinister, who gave Gambit a certain Surgery, removing part of his brain in order to dampen his powers and make them more manageable. Number 9, 
Captain Adam. Captain Adam was originally a Charlton Comics character, the same way that the Blue Beetle used to be. DC Comics eventually purchased Charlton's collection of heroes, and as a result, he was introduced into the DC Universe. In the DC retelling of his origin, Nathaniel Adam was a man sentenced to death for treason. He was offered the opportunity to instead sign up for an experiment designed to test the structural integrity of an alien metal. To test this, they placed Adam in a metal cage and then blasted it with a nuclear explosion. He was vaporized, but much like the Watchmen character he inspired, Dr. Manhattan, he was reformed with the metal now covering his skin. Captain Adam can tap into the quantum field and convert the energy into powerful blasts. He can also generate and manipulate matter, such as when he transformed Green Arrow's arrows into butterflies. Captain Adam has to be very careful with his powers though, as he is essentially a walking nuke. When he uses his upper power levels, he will start to leak radiation and, if his metal skin is ruptured, he risks detonating like an atomic bomb and destroying whatever city he's in. Number 8. Radius Jared Corbo is a mutant who was raised with his half-brother Adrian in the East Ontario town of Orlu at an orphanage called Hull House, or as the orphans nicknamed it, Hell House. Unbeknownst to most of the residents, Hull House was actually being operated by the Canadian superhero agency known as Department H, as a way to find and recruit members for their various superhero teams, such as Alpha Flight. Sometimes they waited until the orphans were of age, and sometimes they would have them adopted by the department so that they could participate while being underage. Which sounds bad, but when you think about it, isn't that different from what Professor X is doing. Jared's mutant powers allow him to create a force field, which he is incapable of shutting off. While this protects him from harm, it also means that he can't touch or be touched by others, and is even unable to effectively shower, and can't eat without wearing a special eating filter which converts the food to a form that can get through the field, allowing Jared to get the necessary nutrients he needs to survive. Number 7. Iska the Unbeaten Iska is thousands of years old and is the sister of Genesis, who is the wife of Apocalypse. She is a hard warrior who respects power and strength like the other mutants of Arako, and her powers reflect this. Iska's power is Tychokinesis, which is the power over luck and probability, but specifically, her power means that she cannot lose, or the better way to say it is that she always wins. This includes one-on-one -on -one contests, votes, and wagers, but also larger battles where she is a member of a team or army. In contests of skill, her power, including some limited shape-shifting, gives her the talents she needs to win, or she might just win through improbable circumstances. So so far it sounds pretty good. Always winning is so good it just sounds like ridiculous and lazy writing. But it also means that in larger battles or wars, her powers weigh the probability of the two sides and make her defect from the losing side and join the winning side, even if the losing side was composed of those she truly cared about. Meaning that even though she still technically won, she betrayed her closest friends and allies. So she has a great power, but no control at all on how it manifests. Number 6. Cyclops Scott Summers has always had trouble controlling his powers, that's no secret, but during the events of 2012's Avengers vs X-Men, it only got worse. In this 12 issue storyline, we see the Phoenix Force get fragmented and inhabit 5 prominent characters in the X-Men universe. Cyclops, Emma Frost, Colossus, Magic, and Namor, and the whole storyline basically watches the Avengers and the X-Men do their best to take down the Phoenix Force. In issue 11, we saw a crazed Phoenix Force-powered Cyclops lose himself to his newfound thirst for power. The issue ended with a big showdown between Cyclops and his mentor, Professor Xavier. Xavier tried to convince his surrogate son to relinquish the powers and come back to the good side, but Cyclops resisted and instead embraced the full power of the Phoenix and killed Charles Xavier. This was such a shocking moment because Scott is normally so level-headed and controlled, and to see him so power-hungry and full of rage is a side of him I never thought we would see. It can be argued that it wasn't his fault since he wasn't the mastermind behind everything, but he is still the one who lost control and snapped, so he has to deal with what he did. 
Number 5, Green Arrow. Another character who is usually pretty good at keeping his cool, however, in 2010's Justice League Cry for Justice storyline, his patience and control are pushed to their absolute limits, and needless to say, he did not deal with the pressure too well. This is all thanks to Prometheus, a villain determined to attack superheroes and hit them where it hurts the most. In this story, the Red Arrow had his arm completely ripped off, and then his daughter was crushed as part of Prometheus's plan. This really pissed off the Green Arrow, but he decided to let Prometheus go after he'd been captured, and it seemed like, for a time, that the Green Arrow had kept his emotions in check. But then the scene shifted to Prometheus's lair, and we saw that was not the case, even in the slightest. Prometheus heard a noise behind him, and when he turned to investigate, he saw that Green Arrow had come to pay him a little visit. After a very brief discussion, the Green Arrow shoots an arrow straight into Prometheus's forehead, sticking him to the wall and killing him, stating that Prometheus never knew that at his core, Green Arrow wasn't a hero. He was a hunter. Check this storyline out for yourself and let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I personally love Gre Green Arrow and I think this ruthless side of him is pretty freaking sweet. Number 4, Spider-Man. Back in Black, a great ACDC song, but also a Spider-Man storyline that ran in 2007. After a sniper's bullet changes everything for Peter Parker and his life, he dons his infamous black costume once more. From then on, Spider-Man would stop at nothing to find the man who pulled the trigger and, even more important, the man who gave the order to kill. This is truly Spider-Man at his darkest hour. Now I realize that was probably a little bit vague, so I'll just tell you straight up. Aunt May is the one who was shot, and this caused Peter to go off the rails. He tracked down everyone involved with the shooting and found that it all led to the Kingpin. He found the Kingpin in prison and he beat the living daylights out of him. He beat him within an inch of his life and then promised to kill him if Aunt May was to actually die. After he beat him to a pulp and got Fisk really scared, Peter decided to let him live with the shame of being handily beaten by a guy half his size in front of literally everyone in prison. Certainly surprising that the joke filled webhead could be so ruthless, but I don't know, can you really blame him? Give the storyline a read for yourself by checking out 2007's Amazing Spider Man number 539 to 543. Number 3, The Hulk. You always have to include the Hulk on any list that involved the hero losing control, cause like, you know, it's the Hulk, it's kind of his thing. In World War Hulk, the sequel to Planet Hulk, the Hulk is married to Kara, and they have a child on the way. After he's tricked by the Illuminati and sent into space with her, their spaceship exploded and she and the unborn child were unfortunately killed. Now, we all know that the Hulk has a very bad temper during the best of times, so you can only imagine what this tragedy did to him. I feel like I don't need to say it, but I will anyways, he went absolutely insane. He traveled from place to place smashing everyone and everything in his path, and he single-handedly destroyed so many different superheroes that I won't even start to list them because I would be here for hours. Eventually his rage grows to such an extreme that the radiation threatens the entire Earth and he is taken down to save the planet. Even if you consider how grouchy the Hulk is and how often he loses it, this is entirely a different level for him. Give the story a read for yourself, starting with 2007's World War Hulk Prologue World Breaker Volume 1. Number 2, Wolverine. You probably know what I'm going to be talking about if you're a fan of the X-Men series when it comes to Wolverine. In the Wolverine Old Man Logan storyline, we get to see the vicious side of Wolverine that we have all come to know and love. However, this time it wasn't necessarily his fault. So basically it's the future and Logan is now an old man and he hasn't used the Wolverine persona or his claws since this mysterious night in the past when a bunch of villains supposedly attacked. We learn through some flashbacks that a massive group of 40 supervillains attacked the X-Men mansion and during this attack Wolverine gets in touch with his primal side and goes absolutely crazy and kills every single one of them. After the fight and the intense slaughter, things change and Wolverine realizes it was all just an illusion. The entire time Wolverine had his vision and mind altered by Mysterio and all the villains that he killed in combat were actually his fellow X-Men. This destroyed Logan and he decided to retire his Wolverine mantle after that, essentially killing that part of him so he would never do something like that again. It's definitely a very sad way to end a run as a hero but I see why he felt that was necessary. Give this a read for yourself starting with 2018's Old Man Logan Volume 1, Number 1 and while you're at it, why not rewatch the movie Logan and see if you can, I don't know, draw any comparison? Number one. Terra. If you're like me, then your first introduction to Terra was probably through the Teen Titans TV show, and man, I always remember thinking how cool of a character she was, and in the specific issue that I'm going to be talking about today, we get to see exactly how crazy strong she can be. The Dark Multiverse Teen Titans The Judas Contract reimagines one of the most renowned stories in comic book history, The Judas Contract. In this reimagining, Terra's betrayal starts with not the Teen Titans, but with Deathstroke himself. Now free from her mentor's influence, and supercharged by the same serum that turn Slade Wilson into the world's deadliest man, 
TerraWorks to forge a new destiny written in the Teen Titans blood. Now calling herself Gaia and viewing herself as a literal goddess, she changed her costume and attacked the Teen Titans Tower, killing Raven, Starfire, Wonder Girl, and Cyborg before battling against Robin and Kid Flash, who she was also able to overpower and kill. I could continue the list of who she killed, but again, we would be here forever, so I'll save you the trouble. She managed to destabilize the Earth's core, and from then on, she forced every remaining being on Earth to bow down to her as a god. Pretty insane, right? Highly recommend you check this story out for yourself. Amanda McKnight and I have been talking about it ever since I started here, and we would love to hear your thoughts on it too. Number six, Ghost Rider. Don't worry, I won't be referencing the movie starring Nicolas Cage as Johnny Blaze, because if you sat through them like I did, I think you've suffered enough. Now, Ghost Rider's powers come from his black magic bond to the demon Zarathos, and he's always been a thorn in Johnny's side for decades. Thanks to this connection, Blaze gained the ability to transform into Ghost Rider, who possesses a vast array of powers ranging from Hellfire manipulation to superhuman stamina. Similar to Bruce Banner, Blaze had very little influence on Rider's actions in the beginning, succumbing to Zarathos' control any time evil prevented itself. Over time, he gradually gained more control over his alter ego, using his powers to not only vanquish baddies, but to protect the innocent. Zarathos resurfaced several times over the years with various schemes to regain control of Johnny Blaze's physical body. At times, he's been successful, causing Blaze to once again lose himself to the Rider, but usually Blaze manages to come out on top and regain control. Take a look at his first appearance all the way back in 1972 in Marvel Spotlight number 5. Number 5, New 52 Superman. We all know our prime Earth's Clark Kent. So let's take a look at another version of the superhero that didn't stick around for too long. Now, possessing many of the same powers, there are many things that led to this demise of this version of Superman. One being the use of a new power he dubbed the Solar Flare. This power released a massive blast from his body, using every last bit of solar energy stored in his cells. The devastating power alone made this ability a very useful one, but it left Clark powerless for 24 hours after each use, because his body needed time to reabsorb the sunlight. After repeated use, Superman found himself less and less super, losing his powers one by one. Fast forward past a few fights and a pretty bad kryptonite infection, and we find Superman needing to use this ability one last time, and it really was the last. Our new 52 Superman is finished off for good, and if it weren't for the pre-new 52 Superman finding his way to this universe, there would have been no one to protect it. Check out the storyline for yourself and let me know in the comments what you think. Number 4, Raven. In the comics, Raven's powers weren't always clearly defined, and neither was it her control over, over them, which is why we'll be focusing on the Raven that we saw in 2003's Teen Titans TV series. Born the daughter of the demon Trigon and the human Arella, Raven was primarily raised by monks and was taught to use her powers and abilities, as well as learn to keep her emotions in check. Now, upon learning that one day she would be used as a key element in her father's eventual takeover of the universe, she ends up fleeing to Earth, hoping to escape the fate where she eventually joins the Teen Titans. In the cartoon, it's clearly stated that her powers are dependent on her emotions, so the reason she acts so cold is to keep her abilities in check. But, despite her attempts, Raven is still human. Well half-human, I guess, and her emotions get the better of her a few times in the series. In the episode Fear Itself, when, after watching a scary movie, Raven's fears were manifested as a real beast that haunted the Titan's towers, and in the episode Switched, we learn of the connection between Raven's powers and her emotions when Starfire, in Raven's body, causes havoc in her chaotic emotions. Now, it really makes sense why Raven meditated so much throughout the series, and man, do I miss that show. If you haven't watched it, please do yourself a favor and find it on the internet. You will not regret it. Number three, Friendly Fire. Now, little is known about this DC Comics character, other than that he's not the best hero. With the ability to shoot blasts of fire and energy from his hands, you'd think that he would have learned to aim early on, but alas, he seemed to have skipped that step. He was a terrible shot, so he consistently hit his friends and not the villains, making the name Friendly Fire make sense. Once a member of the Hero Team Section 8, which was basically a big old group of losers, I mean, come on, their members consisted of a guy who carried around a window to throw at people, and another guy who welded dead dogs to villains. He kind of looked like a superstar compared to those guys. His final adventure was probably the worst out of all of them, because instead of hitting the villain with his powers, he ends up blowing his own head. Check out this tragic yet hilarious story for yourself in 1997's Hitman number 18. Number 2, Franklin Richards. Known as Powerhouse, Franklin Richards is the son of Reed and Susan Richards, and we've all learned by now, being the child of two mutants usually leads to some crazy strong powers that are impossible to control. Considered an Omega-level mutant, Richards possesses a ridiculous number of powers, which earned him the title of the most powerful mutant ever born. Because Franklin's powers manifested at a young age rather than during puberty, as with most mutants, 
his control over his abilities wasn't always that great. In fact, Franklin once defeated Ultron when he accidentally released a wave of psionic energy as a result of Ultron's radiation. He also once resurrected Galactus, created a villain known as Modulus when he felt jealous of his newborn sister, and even transformed Ben Grimm back into the thing to rescue him from an Asgardian warrior. This kid is truly not someone you want to mess with. Why not check out his story for yourself through his first appearance in 1968's Fantastic Four Annual Number 6. And number one, so many of the X-Men. Now, this one had to be combined into one point because my goodness, there are so many X-Men who have trouble controlling their powers. Here, let me, let me give you a few examples. Cyclops can't control his optic blast without the help of a specifically made Pfizer. Beast keeps mutating into various furry forms. Wolverine's lost his healing factor countless times and has even died because of it. If Rogue touches anyone, she involuntarily takes their powers and even their lives if the connection isn't prolonged. Meryl once lost the ability to control her excessive bone growth. Hot-headed Chamber has basically no lower jaw or much of a neck thanks to the energy blasts that emanate from his head, and Legion barely has any control over any of his abilities. Now, obviously this all makes sense since, since the nature of a mutation would obviously have its drawbacks, but seriously, when you list it all like this, it seems a little bit excessive. Number 10, the Plutonian. If you're familiar with the Irredeemable series, then you likely already know why I put it so low on the list today. But if you're not, that's no worries. This entire storyline is about the Plutonian, the supposed strongest hero ever to exist, and is all about a superhero snapping and losing control. Very little is known about the Plutonian, even by the people who are supposed to be very close with him, but he draws a lot of parallels with Superman as he has a Fortress of Solitude-like hideout in a volcano, and not to mention his powers are basically the same with a few more sprinkled in there for fun. Mark Wade, the writer, argues that not all superheroes are mentally equipped to deal with the power and responsibility of being a superhero, so it's bound to happen that one would lose it and just go completely mental. This story follows the Plutonian as he slaughters the people of Earth and all of his former friends, family, and allies. The comic evolves into making the Plutonian a supervillain, or at least shows him in the early stages of it. He's a hero on the edge of losing complete control, and it does a great job of showing how others are meant to deal with the mess that he creates. I highly recommend you check out Boom Studios' Irredeemable series. It has a total of 37 issues, and it really is a great read. Number 9, Green Lantern. The specific Green Lantern that I'll be talking about is Hal Jordan after his home was destroyed in 1992-1993's Death of Superman storyline. At one point during the story, Coast City was destroyed by Mongol and Hal was not very happy about that to say the least. To try and resurrect the city back to its former glory, Hal attempts to use the power of his Green Lantern ring, but its power is revoked before he can make it permanent. Consumed by grief and anger, he ends up becoming the villain Parallax and goes on a mass killing spree, killing almost all of the other Green Lanterns so he could take their rings and absorb their power. It ended up getting to the point where Hal was so powerful that he was one of the most feared superheroes in the galaxy, and to date, this is considered to be one of the most strongest iterations of the character. And even though it's not really his fault since he was under the control of Parallax, you'd still think that his strong will would at least have tried to resist the temptation, but alas, that wasn't the case. Why not give this story a read for yourself so you can see just how strong Hal became by starting with 1992's Superman, The Man of Steel, Volume 1, Number 18. Number 8. Ant-Man. The specific series that I'll be talking about for Ant-Man is the Ultimatum series that ran in 2016, and yes, I know that it's not considered canon by many people, but we're not talking canon, we're talking about losing control, and that's exactly what happened to Ant-Man in this twisted storyline. Within the first five pages of the first issue, everything goes terribly wrong, as out of nowhere the sky darkens and all of Manhattan is flooded, and many of our heroes are submerged underwater. Some are lucky enough to resurface, but unfortunately Janet Van Dyne, aka the Wasp, drowned and Hank was unable to find her no matter how hard he tried. Following the tidal wave and in the second issue after the water had cleared, we see the entire city of Manhattan in shambles and overrun with criminals doing their thing, and this is exactly when we see Ant-Man and Hawkeye come across the villain The Blob as he's feasting on Janet's body. This obviously did not sit well with Hank, so standing at about 60 stories tall as Giant Man, he just picks up The Blob, states that he is not going to play around with him, and then straight up just bites his head off and spits it out on the ground. The loss of a loved one can really push people to do some crazy things, and apparently it can push a hero to the point of murder. Check out this storyline for yourself, or feel free to skip ahead to issue 3, where this gruesome scene takes place. Number 7, Daredevil. 
In 2003's Daredevil Volume 2, number 49, we get to see a side of Daredevil that we rarely get to see. Obviously, Matt Murdock has gone off the rails a few times and flipped out thanks to his bad temper, but man, this was different. In this issue, we see Bullseye show up at Matt's place after he's already killed Karen Page and Elektra, just to kill another one of his girlfriends, and upon his arrival, Matt immediately throws him out a window and begins the beatdown of a lifetime. He took so much joy from beating the villain and mocking the Bullseye tattoo on his forehead, and just to really bring home the rage and get his point across, Daredevil grabbed a rock from the ground and carved the bullseye into the villain's forehead, making it even more permanent than it already was by forever scarring it. It's not even the action that's so insane, because, like I said, with Ant-Man, the loss of a loved one can really lead you to do some pretty crazy things, but it's his reaction afterward, just smiling ear to ear, biggest grin you've ever seen in your life. Give this issue a read for yourself to see how truly merciless DD can really be, because man, saying I was surprised is truly an understatement. <laughs> Number six. Black Bolt. Blackagar Boltigan made his first appearance in Fantastic Four number 45. He is the Inhuman King, who when exposed to the mutagenic Terrigen Mist, was granted power of an incredible level, even for an Inhuman. His power comes from his voice, with even the smallest whisper being capable of rocking a battleship. This power was discovered when he was just a baby, and in order to protect his community, he was kept away from society until he was 19, in order for him to try and learn to control his powers. When finally let into society, he saw a Kree warship which he brought down with his voice. Unfortunately, the ship landed on the local government officials, including his parents, and he accidentally became the leader of the Inhumans at age 20. He is really good at not speaking now, as he knows all too well how little control he has over his powers and their effects on others. Number 5. Radioactive Man. Not to be confused with the Simpsons superhero whose goggles do nothing, or with the DC Comics villain, we are talking about the Marvel hero known as Radioactive Man. Making his debut in Journey into Mystery number 3 in 1963, Chen Lu is a nuclear physicist who exposed himself to small amounts of radiation at a time until he was able to build up a powerful immunity to it, as well as the ability to manipulate it to his benefit. However, he is unable to stop being radioactive, and therefore he can't be around anyone without giving them radiation sickness. He's able to mitigate this to an extent with the use of a containment suit but this only works for a limited amount of time. This was a constant issue for the character, but later issues later retconned his abilities so he was able to have greater control of his powers, allowing him to not give all of his friends cancer. Number 4. Rogue Anna Marie first appeared in Avengers Annual number 10. She was raised in a hippie commune in Mississippi with her close friend, Cody Robbins. One day, Cody decided that it was time to shoot his shot with Anna Marie, proving that the whole the worst she could do is say no thing is a bit inaccurate. When Cody and Anna made direct skin contact, her mutant powers drained him of his life force, leaving him in a permanent coma. She eventually found a way to make this power work for good when she joined the X-Men, and she got more powers once she made contact with Carol Danvers. But overall, Rogue is unable to control her draining powers and is forced to wear gloves at all times in order to avoid making direct contact with anyone who she could accidentally hurt. Number 3. Friendly Fire Friendly Fire is a member of Section 8 who has the ability to shoot powerful energy blasts out of his hands that deal devastating damage. Unfortunately, as his name suggests, he is totally incapable of hitting what he is aiming at, and instead, always ends up hitting his teammates. This has led to a couple of deaths of Section 8 members, but the worst death has got to be the one that occurred when the team went up against the mini angled ones. These strange visitors attacked the team, easily dispatching team members like Jean de Baton Baton and Dog Welder. Friendly Fire realized that it was up to him and he had to come through for his friends. As he put it, I gotta do it. Just this once. Gotta hit what I'm aiming at. Can't let my buddies down. Must hold the power. He unleashed the full force of his blast and blew his own head off, barely being able to utter the word crap before dying. Number two, Infectious Lass. 
First appearing in Superboy number 201, Drura Sept from the planet Somator is part of an alien race whose bodies play host to a variety of different microorganisms. The people of her planet are able to play host to these bacteria without suffering any ill effects, but they were able to infect the people around her. This sounds like it could have some potential for a superhero power, the ability to unleash germ warfare on your enemies. But unfortunately, Infectious Lass is unable to control who she infects and is just as likely to infect any of her allies as she is her enemies. She tried out for the Legion of Superheroes, but was denied membership as she was deemed more of a risk to the Legion members than an asset. Number 1. The Hulk When Bruce Banner was accidentally caught in the blast radius of his experimental gamma bomb, he underwent a startling metamorphosis. Whenever he becomes angry or outraged, he transforms into the Hulk. The Hulk is of course a giant green rage monster, who is prone to going on rampages and smashing things. Hulk is viewed as a monster by society, and by extension, so is Banner. Banner has to make constant efforts to control the beast within. But since it would be a boring comic if the Hulk never came out, Bruce constantly loses control and unleashes the Incredible Hulk onto the world. Coming in at number 10 we have Quicksilver, the speedster that both Fox and Disney were throwing into the movies which had a lot of comic fans confused, like how many nerds out there had to explain to their friends why the same character was in two movies but played by different people but they weren't in the same universe. Thankfully the MCU is now all connected and we don't need to have that conversation again. As long as Sony doesn't try to rip Spider-Man away from us, I couldn't handle that another time. For fans of the X-Men comics, you will be well aware of the House of M storyline. This was one of the most monumental events that has ever happened in the Marvel Universe, and it changed the mutant race forever. Scarlet Witch was going through an immense amount of emotional stress, and she was at her breaking point and decided that she would use her reality-altering powers to reshape the world forever. She called out, no more humans, and the population of superpowered beings that was in the range of 1.2 million was now pulled down to less than 200. Over a million mutants were stripped of their powers, and Quicksilver was a long with them. I wonder how it felt experiencing the crushing boredom of traffic for the first time ever in your life. Coming in at number 9 we have the Green Lantern. Hal Jordan has often been used as a representation of the man when it comes to any sort of social issue brought up in the DC Universe when he's involved. After all he is a cop so it kind of fits the bill for his character. Well in the 70s there was a lot going on in the world when it came to American politics and DC wanted to take this on with Green Lantern and the Green Arrow. They were going down to try and calm the American people. Do you think these two guys became friends just because they both wear green? It was like the easiest form of association? Well, the two of them went down to confront some American miners who were protesting for better wages. And because Hal had been spending so much time on Earth, his ring was feeling a little bit weak. He tried to confront the miners to get them to stop, and in this moment, his ring lost all of its power. Also, the miners were fully locked and loaded with guns, so it was a little bit of a sticky situation. Coming in at number 8, we have Miss Marvel. Marvel, one of the most super powerful characters in the Marvel Universe. Following a similar space cop motif that Green Lantern uses, it would seem that very few people would be able to stand up to her. I mean, we all remember in Avengers Endgame when she took a headbutt from Thanos without even flinching, but that doesn't mean that she's impervious to any sort of harm, especially when we're talking about harm coming from Rogue. Miss Marvel and Rogue got into a one-on-one -on -one conflict that would change the two characters forever. In this Clash, Rogue comes in contact with Miss Marvel and uses her vampiric power draining abilities, but she wasn't nice about it. Rogue drained Miss Marvel until she sucked out every last ounce of super powered energy that was inside of her, making Rogue insanely strong and leaving Miss Marvel not that marvelous. Next on the list, we got Superman. Some people would love to see Superman become less powerful just because it might make the character a little bit more interesting, but that's tough to do because so much of the DC Universe has been built around his godlike presence. One way that this has been done tastefully was when the New 52 
run of Superman introduced a new power. Superman could now perform what would be called a super flare. As many of you know, Superman gets his power from the sun. This solar energy builds up in his body like a smartphone battery charging. On a few occasions, when he comes out of contact with the sun for too long, he will lose his powers and all of his abilities. But with this super flare, he can unleash all that energy stored in his body in one blast like a massive nuke. However, when he does this, he will be without his powers for 24 hours as his body sucks in that good, good sunlight. Next on the list, we have Storm, one of the coolest comic book characters ever created. I've always been a fan of any hero who has storm powers because there is so much you can do with them. Got a fire? Bring in some rain. Got a big monster? Hit it with some lightning. Got a town that needs clean energy? Build a windmill and then create some wind. But in Uncanny X-Men issue 185, Storm would no longer be the queen of weather. This was because the future mutant Forge worked with Henry Peter Gyrich to come up with a weapon that could be used to neutralize a mutant's powers. See, Gyrich was a little bit peeved because Rogue had recently gotten into a major conflict with S.H.I.E.L.D. This led to Gyrich attempting to depower Rogue with this newly crafted weapon, but a misfire led to it hitting Storm. Right next on the list we have Bruce Banner. Jason Aaron did one of my favorite runs of the Hulk. There was a short series where this time Hulk gets rid of Banner, not the other way around. The Hulk goes to see Doctor Doom, and Doom genetically grows a Banner clone and then surgically removes the section of Hulk's brain which contains Banner and implants it into this new clone. So now the two can coexist without each other. Hulk actually deals with this very well. He checks out the world and ignores everything that the previous super-powered world would bring to him, but it refuses to leave him alone. Banner eventually goes mad and starts making an island of super-powered Hulk beasts with an attempt to recreate the Hulk in his own body. A team of mad scientist hunters commission the Hulk to work with them to take out the newly insane Banner, and the two sides of the same coin go head on, and that's only in the first few issues. It gets way crazier down the road. Right after after Hulk, we have Thor. The Asgardian has always had a lot of family problems. If he's not fighting with his brother, it's with his dad or his sister. On one occasion, Odin thought it was time to teach Thor a tough lesson. Because Thor is insanely powerful, he's always walked around as a brutish thug who wants to punch first and ask questions later. Odin thought it was time that he learned some empathy for those who aren't able to wield a hammer that was made out of a fallen star. So he stripped him of his power and then sent him to Earth. Now Thor might have walked around like an angry kid who wants to have cookies for breakfast, but Odin solved this problem by also wiping his memory. This way Thor would be forced to be a real person and see what it's like to feel and act like a normal person. Of course he eventually got his memory back and returned to the mantle of God of Thunder. Right after that we have Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange lost his powers in one of the coolest, dumbest ways possible. Earth was under attack from the Imperi Cool, which are a futuristic robot race from another dimension. They hate magic and travel through time and space to destroy it in every form. The Imperial Cool came to Earth to battle Doctor Strange, and Strange summoned up all the magic on Earth into his body in an attempt to destroy the Imperial Cool leader. But this failed and left Strange in a weakened state with no magic left on the planet for him to use his powers. Coming in at number two, we have Wonder Woman. Strength is a cornerstone of this character, and with the loss of her powers, it was shown that she can represent that in more ways than one. In the 70s, Wonder Woman willingly gave up her powers because she sought to follow her heart. If she was to stay the super-powered goddess, it would mean she would have to return to Themyscira and leave behind the heartthrob Steve Trevor. In her newly depowered state, she didn't give up her life of hero work. She went on to study a new martial art, probably making her even more powerful in the long run. I mean, if you can kick someone's butt while you're just regular flesh and blood, then when you pack some super powered juice into that, you can start knocking people out like 19 year old Mike Tyson. Part of the change to this character was to coincide with the women's movement that was happening in the 70s. DC Comics wanted to represent a strong female character that could be closer associated to the female readers that were picking up the comic. And for the number one spot, we have Wolverine. It would be pretty hard to be Wolverine without the powers. I mean, even take Superman. On a few occasions, he has been stripped of his powers, and he's still that Boy Scout at heart, and will do what's right no matter what. But with Wolverine, a big part of his personality is being able to be punched in the face and come back like nothing happened, which probably made the loss of his powers even more interesting. Back in 2013, Wolverine was infected with a very advanced virus that attacked his healing factor. It basically made him so he was just a regular guy. 
guy. Well, a regular guy, they could probably still crank out 100 pull-ups. But this was so severe that he couldn't even use his claws anymore, so he had wrist-mounted claws. I guess you can take the powers out of the Wolverine, but you can't stop him from trying to slice people in half. Now, this level of aggression without the healing factor backing him up eventually led to his death. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching today's list. Now, as promised, I'm going to be giving you guys my picks for some amazing nerd-themed podcasts that I highly recommend you go check out. My first pick has got to be Inside Gaming Daily. Are you a big fan of gaming news, but you don't really have a lot of time to spend looking up everything or spend time looking at a long podcast or actually listening to a long podcast, and you also want to stay up to date on everything that's going on in the gaming world? Well, then this is perfect for you. Inside Gaming is a daily gaming news podcast from Rooster Teeth and it's only about 10 minutes long. I love this podcast. I listen to it all the time. My next pick is Fat Man on Batman. Kevin Smith's podcast where he keeps fans up to date on what's going on in the comic book world and interviews some amazing people from the comic book world. And my final pick has to be Welcome to Night Vale. If you're into storytelling podcasts and you're a fan of horror, then this has to be the perfect pick for you. Welcome to Night Vale is a fictional radio show in a fictional town that is packed full of so much bizarre are supernatural happenings that has now become normalized. At number six is Hell Cow. So here's Bessie, just your mundane, run-of-the-mill cow, right? Chewing cud, enjoying the past reviews, just living that utterly predictable life. But then out of the blue, or should I say out of the moonlight, comes Count Dracula. You see, old Count D was feeling a bit peckish and couldn't find his usual human buffet. So instead, he turns his attention to her unsuspecting bovine buddy, thus deciding to go for a milkshake and takes a bite out of Bessie. And you would think that would mark the end of Bessie's cow catastrophe, right? Well, wrong. Drax Bite turns her into a vampire cow, sprouting wings and sporting super bovine speed and strength. Now, I know what you're thinking. Is Bessie the cream of the crop when it comes to superheroes? Well, I mean, probably not. I mean, let's be honest. When you're stacking up against the likes of Iron Man, Spider-Man, and the Hulk, a vampire cow might seem a bit, well, cheesy. But hey, Marvel Comics saw otherwise, so who am I to milk the situation for more puns? At number five is Friendly Fire. Ah, Friendly Fire, the heroes whose powers took an unfortunate detour. Imagine having the ability to shoot out potent energy bolts, only to find that your aim is better suited for friendly gatherings rather than crime fighting. Yeah, you guessed it, Friendly Fire's energy bolts have an uncanny knack for hitting his allies and set of foes. And in a rather iconic twist, he once managed to hit himself, sealing his own fate. This ill-fated hero found a home in Section 8, a team of misfit superheroes whose powers don't quite align with their aspirations. Friendly Fire's tale serves as a stark reminder that not every power is a guaranteed win in the world of superheroes, and sometimes fate has its own peculiar plans. And number four is the one and only Doorman. Ah, Doorman, the teleporter with a name that's as bland as a loaf of unsalted bread. Sure, teleportation sounds cool, but his version involves turning himself into a living doorway. I mean, picture this, you're in battle, explosions everywhere, and Doorman's like, walk through me, buddy. It's kind of like an awkward game of superhero limbo. I mean, Doorman seriously needs an upgrade. Less doormat, more dynamo. Until then, watch out for the human portal blocking your way to victory. At number three is Matter Eater Lad. His ability to consume, devour, and digest just about anything sounds like the ultimate party trick, right? I mean, talk about ultimate power snacking. But here's the catch. Raiders have had a tough time serving scenarios where his powers truly shine. While it's entertaining to picture him chowing down on a villain's nefarious plans, the real challenge lies in finding practical applications for his abilities in a world already populated with characters capable of flight, super strength and laser vision. Instead of epic battles, he's often relegated to the sidelines, left to deal with things like interplanetary diplomacy rather than superhero feats. Not to say that that doesn't demand superheroes, just not ones with his particular skill set. But what if he got a power up? I mean, imagine him not just eating matter, but gaining temporary properties from the molecules he munches on. Like, I don't know, maybe the waste products from ingesting certain elements gives him atomic flatulence. I don't know. Suddenly, he's not just a quirky eater, but he's a versatile asset. But until then, let's chew on the possibilities. At number two is Stone Boy. Stone Boy is a superhero who's immovable as a boulder and as useful as, well, a boulder. You see, he has this nifty power to transform into solid stone, making him invulnerable to almost anything. Sounds awesome, right? Well, here's the catch. Once he is stoned up, he is stuck in place, as mobile as a literal rock. Sounds too familiar, but wait, here's more. Stone Boy hails from the planet Zwen, where he takes a coffee break. Their planet rotates at a snail's pace, and during their celestial crawl, everyone on his planet turns into statues for a cosmic power nap, Stone Boy included. Now imagine being a superhero trying to save the day when you can't even chase down a snail. I mean, Stone Boy desperately needs a power up that lets him rock 
and roll. Otherwise, he's just a really tough garden decoration in the grand scheme of things. And at number one is Aquaman. Aquaman, the ruler of the seas and communicator with aquatic life, making him useful exclusively in marine missions. Otherwise, what's he got going for him? An impressive swim speed? Yeah, I'm starting to wonder if he's swimming in the shallow end of the power pool. I mean, sure, talking to fish is cool and all, but in a world of metahumans with abilities that can reshape reality, it's a bit like showing up to a western cowboy duel armed with a rubber duck. Now don't get me wrong, Aquaman has his moments of epicness, but let's face it, his power sets sometimes feel more like he's suited for a marine biologist than a mass vigilante. I mean, imagine if Aquaman could control water at will, shaping it into powerful weapons or using it to manipulate his environment. And if he could water bend, think about the potential. If he could, say, control the rate at which water molecules vibrate, thus allowing him to freeze or boil water at will, the applications for that power set are boundless. I mean, it's not that Aquaman is without his charm or usefulness, but a world where heroes are constantly pushing the boundaries of their abilities, our underwater champion could use a boost. After all, oceans cover more than 70% of our planet, and that's a lot of untapped potential. So whether it's through ancient artifacts or cosmic revelations or some inventive storyline twist, let's just hope that Aquaman gets the power up he deserves and emerges from the depths as a true force to be reckoned with. At number 10 is Cyclops. Thank you to usernames are taken on three on Reddit for the following rat, which sums it up perfectly. Cyclops is one of the very few characters in Marvel and DC whose powers have remained basically the same since the very beginning. Hell, if anything, he's gotten nerfed. Many Cyclops fans would say that he doesn't need any power up and is just as good as he is. And as a huge Cyclops fan myself, I totally disagree. I mean, it would have been okay if not for literally almost everybody else in X-Men getting power ups after power ups. I mean, just look at the original X-Men team. X-Men went from throwing snowballs and making some ice structures to becoming an Omega level mutant who's basically immortal. Angel went Archangel and got much more powerful wings and physique. Beast got countless transformations. Jean, I mean, where to even start with Jean? She only had the telekinesis in the beginning, then she got telepathy, then she got stronger and stronger, then she got the Phoenix Force, and even the time displaced younger Jean, don't ask, got some kind of pink colored powers that made her much more powerful. Now you may think it's a bad argument just because others are getting something Cyclops should get too. Or that power creep is bad and it's a good thing that Cyclops hasn't been the victim of that yet. And I would have agreed if not for almost every single person in X-Men getting power up. At a certain point, a character needs to be more powerful even if there's the dreaded power creep on the horizon because as it is, the character is just weak. <coughs> <clears throat> Piccolo. But this isn't the only reason Cyclops needs a power up. The other reason is the nature of his powers. They're very restrictive and one dimensional. That kind of superpower needs to be absurdly strong or it's meaningless. I mean, seriously, Rogue probably has better destructive feats than Cyclops. Like, when was the last time Cyclops blasted through something that was supposed to be really tough? I mean, has he ever done that? Because he needs to. I mean, okay, think about it this way. What makes the Flash stand out in the Justice League even though Superman is there? Because writers understood that seeing as the Flash only has super speed, he needs to be better at it than Superman. And they added a lot more powers because of the speed force, but I digress. And it's not just the Flash. Green Arrow and Hawkeye have absurd inhuman levels of marksmanship because that's the only thing they have. Captain America's shield is more durable than almost anything in the entire Marvel Universe because apart from that, he's just a peak human. Batman's intellect and martial arts skills are superior to almost everyone in the whole DC Universe because he doesn't have any powers. Cyclops needs to get in that category, or he needs some other powers to make him more versatile. Powers play a big part in making a superhero interesting. It's not everything, but it does play a bigger part than most people think, in my opinion. If you're enjoying the video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 9 is iBoy. Ah, Trevor Hawkins and his 57 eyes, the ultimate surveillance package. I mean, who wouldn't want telescopic, microscopic, and x-ray vision all at once? But let's be real here, Trevor might be better suited for a career in high-tech espionage or scientific research than straight-up superhero action. I mean, can you imagine him trying trying to blend into a crowd. He's like a walking security camera system. And I bet he never loses at Where's Waldo. Trevor, my man, time to put those eyes to work in ways no one ever imagined and maybe invest in a little, I don't know, stylish eye patch for the sake of good night's sleep. At number eight is Arm Falloff Boy. Arm Falloff Boy has the incredible ability to detach his own limbs, which he can then use as blunt weapons. Right, so you mean like, punching? Oh no, you see, by whipping his leg at you, he's got more leverage and momentum, thus delivering a more powerful blow. Okay, so why wouldn't he just use a staff? What, and have an appendage that's not in use? Clearly you know nothing of battle strategy. As a wannabe superhero, Arm Falloff Boy first appeared when he tried out for the Legion of Superheroes, but since his power is totally useless, no it isn't! Arm Falloff Boy thus became the very first hero to be rejected from the Legion. At number 7 is the infamous Bailey Hoskins with the power
power to self-destruct. This one's one of the more tragic superheroes who ends up losing his life after only four issues when he finally gets to use his power. We can only assume that this character should land on a list like this every single time, considering that the comic series that he's featured in is literally titled The Worst X-Men Ever. But to be fair, this miniseries is known to be a pretty epic read considering the stakes at hand during the run. Bailey has to decide whether or not he's going to use his powers when an evil mutant dictator threatens to take over. But later in X-Men Empire, we're introduced to a strange zombified version of a living mutant known as Explody Boy, who's suggested to be an undead version of Bailey himself. So maybe that version of him is more powerful since he doesn't have to worry about the whole demise thing every time he explodes. But no matter which way you slice it, this is arguably one of the worst superhero powers of all time. Number 10, Detective Chimp. Detective Chimp might just be a chimp who also isn't necessarily known for his fighting prowess and strength, but he's also an extremely intelligent chimp who is considered to be one of the greatest detectives Earth actually has. Not only that, but he's also been tied to the realm of mysticism after he gained the Sword of Night. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Seriously, it feeds the algorithm. Feed the algorithm. Number nine, Forge. Forge is kind of squishy in comparison to some other physically tougher and more durable heroes out there, which is why he makes our cut here. And he's not particularly well known for his fighting prowess, but he is well known for making cool stuff, especially cool weapons. And because of that, he is actually extremely useful. Many also forget that Forge has experience with shamanism and not only has a mutant origin, but an origin that is also attached to the world of magic and mysticism, which honestly is pretty cool. However, for those who want to argue that Forge could march in there alongside someone like Cyclops, I think he'd actually prefer to outfit someone like Cyclops to march into action in his stead, but super souped up so that Psych alone could stand in for a whole small army of heroes and of course, Forge himself. Be like, I'll just make you super cool, you go in there, and then it's basically like there's two of us because you're gonna be that cool. Number eight. Fury. This version of Fury we're focusing on here is mainly known by the name of Lita Hall. This version of the character had her origin changed following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Instead of being Diana Prince, Wonder Woman, and Steve Trevor's daughter, she would become known as the daughter of Helena Cosmatos, also Fury, who was raised instead by Admiral Derek Trevor and Miss America, aka Joan Dale Trevor. In the Sandman universe, she was once the partner of Hector Hall, and the two were going to have a child together when Hector tragically dies. While dead in the real world, Hector's consciousness becomes suspended in a pocket of the dreaming, with Brute and Glob turning him into their new Sandman after Dream's imprisonment. Lita is visited by Hector in her dreams and eventually chooses to stay with him there, but because their child is conceived in the dreaming, he ends up being claimed by the dream lord Morpheus once he himself returns. He forces Hector's spirit to move on and explains that one day he will come for Lita's child, who belongs to the dreaming. Despite her Amazonian like abilities, Lita can be seen as as weak in the traditional superhero sense, as she doesn't act as a hero in Neil Gaiman's Sandman series and instead attempts to pursue a simple, normal life with her son. However, she gets insane anxiety when it comes to being separated from him at any moment because of Dream's threat to one day claim him. Number seven, Dazzler. Dazzler is here not because of how weak she seems, but because of how truly incredible her powers are. The only thing that really makes her seemingly useless is the fact that Alison Blair typically performs to use her powers for her performances as opposed to being, you know, the team leader for the X-Men, which honestly she easily could be and actually has been in regards to multiversal teams that exist. She's played the role of leader before both with her band and with her fellow mutant heroes, but not for the main X-Men team. No, no, no. Dazzler has powers that have been described before to be potentially unlimited in terms of just how much damage she could do. She can transmute sound into light and while her light shows in her concerts might seem kind of tame, she has also used her power set to defeat and defend against heavy hitters like Ulysses Claw, who she permanently defeated, Enchantress, and the Hulk. Number six, Witchfire. I think Witchfire is a super cool hero. She not only looks cool, but she also is a magical hero, one of the most powerful kinds out there, if you ask me. One of them. Not, not the only one, but definitely one of my tops. But still, among those who are gifted with magic, Witchfire's Rebecca Carstairs usually ends up being regarded as lower on the totem 
totem pole. I'm sure there are actually many of you out there who aren't even familiar with this character. And to show how tragically weak she is, shortly after her first appearance in the Prime Earth continuity, she's permanently defeated, with her soul ending up being trapped after the complete destruction of her physical body. Pretty tragic, really, because I just feel like she's so cool. How could you do her like that? Number 5, Cypher. Cypher I'd like to rank a little bit lower on this list because calling him weak feels kind of unfair, considering how integral he's been lately in regards to helping kickstart Krakoa, especially in the comics. But Cypher is still one of those characters that people attribute as being weak because of his power set, and so for that reason, I'm still gonna count him here. But of course, his powers actually happen to be some of the most useful in the comics. It's kind of like a misunderstanding, especially when we consider that they also apply to Cypher being able to communicate with tech and using his ability to understand and communicate in all kinds of languages to become a skilled fighter, which has been interpreted by certain writers as its own language, so Cypher can also be great at fighting. However, not all writers seem to be able to agree on this point, because some people have also seemingly forgot that Cypher is supposed to be really great at fighting. <laughs> Number 4, Tracy 13. Tracy 13 is a magic user who isn't as well known as others like Zatanna, John Constantine, or Dr. Fate from DC Comics. And in that regard, considering she hasn't had as much of a chance to prove herself, she could be considered weak. That being said, she still is a magic user and one who is the daughter of both a magical skeptic and a powerful sorceress, meaning that she possesses both the knowledge of when to be doubtful about someone's prowess and skills and the natural aptitude to perform magic herself, learning from her mother before her mother passed away. In the Prime Earth continuity, the type of magic that Tracy uses is actually known as urban magic, which allows her to fuel her abilities through the power and spirit of sprawling and built up cities. Personally, I also think that's just like a super cool, like like niche magic thing, urban magic. Number three, dupe. Unsurprisingly, yes, a lot of seemingly weak heroes who actually happen to have pretty impressive powers come from the mutant camp of Marvel Comics. Although I don't know if it's ever actually been cemented exactly what dupe is at all, whether that be mutant or something else entirely. Maybe an alien, who knows. However, dupe has definitely found a home with the mutant, so I think we'd still consider him to be an honorary mutant at the very least if we wanted. Dupe has to be one of the weirdest characters of all time, especially when it comes to his storylines. Dupe is also weirdly romantic for a floating green alien language speaking creature that was possibly created as a result of government experimentation. Kind of looks like a jelly bean. Yet also somehow he has a mother. Dupe is a ridiculous character, but when he needs to, he seems to be able to exhibit almost any superpower one could think of. Number two, Booster Gold. Booster Gold could be considered weak because his powers aren't even really powers that he was born with or incurred from a wacky lab accident gone wrong or like worked really hard to earn like abilities, but instead are fueled by technology that he stole in the future, which is where, or rather when, he's from. The future. He used tech to travel to the past and with his knowledge of the past as well, aimed to become a hero in that time period. There, Booster used his tech as well as his knowledge from the future to try and become a hero. And well, he succeeded! Hooray! However, just because Booster can do things like time travel doesn't mean he's always the best at heroics. Case in point, the time he tried to give a gift to Batman and Catwoman in honor of their wedding. His gift was to travel back in time and prevent Bruce's parents from being lost to him all those years ago. But in so doing this also prevented Bruce and Selena from ever getting together and also caused well, a lot of other problems. I mean, Batman wouldn't be Batman without that loss, right? Potentially. Yes, actually, I think that story confirmed that. Number one, Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl is one of my all-time favorite heroes, even if some out there consider her to be weak sauce. Not me, though. I see her true strength. But I can't ignore the fact that on paper, her powers, her mutation, well, it all does sound pretty ridiculous. And she should, by all intents and purposes, not be as OP as we know her to be. However, that being said, I feel like we need to acknowledge the fact that Doreen's abilities, or more specifically, her people skills, are honestly insanely powerful. Squirrel Girl has the ability to befriend pretty much anyone, no matter their alignment. And she is really, and I mean, really good at helping convince criminals to call it quits, either for the day or honestly, for like the rest of their entire lives. Number 10, Shazam. So this one actually made a lot more sense before Shazam was known as Shazam. Back when Shazam was Captain Marvel, the restriction of him needing to say the magic word Shazam to move between his child form as Billy Batson to his superhero form of Captain Marvel worked. It was still pretty silly, honestly, but you know, at least it made sense in some capacity. It worked at least. But now that his literal name is Shazam, because 
copyright issues and they had to change it, this makes things complicated for Billy, because now he can't say his superhero name without causing himself to transform. It's not so useful when he is in his Shazam form and he's introduced himself. Hi, I'm, oh, um, S-H-A-Z-A-M. No, no, no. No need to say it. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that subscribe. And why not ring that bell while you're at it so you don't miss out on any good nerdy lists. Number nine, Wiccan. Wiccan is the spiritual son of Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch. That is to say, while she didn't give birth to him, he's the soul of her own son. Initially, he was made using a fragment of Mephisto's soul, I guess, if he has one. But this is a version of that, but reincarnated. So the soul is there, but the rest is not necessarily Wanda's son, if that makes sense. The spiritual son. Wanda basically made her children exist by warping reality and later had to have these children dispelled due to their connection to Mephisto and the fact that Wanda was warping reality. I mean, Wanda didn't have them dispelled. Other people decided that would be a good idea. Also, people basically thought Wanda was losing her mind which, surprise, surprise, taking her children from her and making her forget they ever existed was actually what pushed her over the edge later when she found out about all that. But that's a story for another list. Wiccan's powers are similar to his mother's. They're tied to magic and mysticism and can be used to warp reality. But in order for Wiccan to do that, he has to speak what he wants to happen into existence. But if he can't speak, he can't do magic. So just put a hand over his mouth and apparently you can just neutralize him that way. Number eight, Zatanna. Zatanna is one of those characters who can do pretty much anything, but even she has rules she needs to play by. Case in point, her powers allow her to cast magical spells. Magic is wild in the sense that you can do pretty much anything with it, but at the same time, it's not necessarily something that is easy to do. It's taken dedication, focus, willpower, years of training, and a natural aptitude for Zatanna to get where she is. And even then, she still has to say all of her spells backwards. Although this might seem like a weird restriction on paper, and yes, you're right, it definitely is, Many weird things in comics are given a reason for why and how they operate the way they do. With Zatanna in Justice League Dark, we'd actually learn that this was because magic being naturally wild had to be tame in some way by rules on Earth. And that was one of the rules that was used to prevent it from becoming too chaotic and disrupting the balance in the world. So that's why Zatanna does that in terms of like the reason. I would actually say it's a pretty good reason. They actually kind of made it make sense. Number seven, Aquaman. Aquaman is an interesting character. Oftentimes he is considered to be one of the weakest members of the Justice League. League and is often the butt of many DC Comics fans jokes. But at the end of the day, Aquaman is actually pretty nuts when it comes to his power set, to be honest, at least in the modern day comics. Although if we go back to some of the more old school rules when it comes to his power set, it's easier to see why so many considered him kind of weak in comparison to his fellow heroes. One restriction that was pretty weird was that Aquaman was being from Atlantis, he, he needed to basically be dipped in water periodically or he would just literally dry out, making him useless and putting him in great danger if he was away from water too long. He's Aquaman, you gotta make sure, you gotta be like, oh man, when was the last time you were in water, Aquaman? Quick, jump in some water. Number six, Cyclops. Cyclops' powers have always been kind of strange. And when we attempted to define them in the comics and explain how they worked exactly, it only got weirder. Initially, Cyclops' optic blasts involved his eyes being a window to a world with unlimited energy. And so when he opens his eyes, this energy blasted out of him in the form of his destructive optic blasts comes from that realm. For many, these blasts can be devastating. If you're hit by them, you could just be straight up dead or incapacitated, depending on the level of energy that Cyclops fired at you. Your flesh would basically be toast. But then again, that's always been weird to me, considering that all that is needed to protect people from Psyche's blast is for him to either wear his ruby quartz visor or glasses, or simply close his eyes which is flesh, which is normally what he could hurt with his blast. I mean, I know he's a mutant, so maybe the inside of his eyelids are like coated in naturally occurring ruby quartz or some equivalent, and he's had that since birth or like since his powers first manifested, but it feels wonky to me. Like with many weird mutant abilities, it's best to just not think about the how and the why too much. Number five, Wildcat. Wildcat initially was boxer Ted Grant, who didn't have any superpowers, but instead had amazing fighting prowess. However, over time, he would gain powers via a curse. It doesn't even sound like a curse based on what it did for him. It gave him resurrection powers, but with the weird limit of the number nine, because he's a cat. Get it? He only has nine lives. I mean, I get it, but also it's still weird. I understand why they did that, but I'm just like, 
guys. And they're like, it's a curse. Why? How is that a curse? Doesn't sound like a curse to me. Sounds great. Number four, Penance. Penance has some of the weirdest powers and is one of the weirdest evolutions of a character I have ever seen. Penance was once known as the hero Speedball, whose powers were connected to kinetic energy, allowing him to harness it to gain momentum and also use it to make himself virtually indestructible with kinetic shielding. However, after the events that began the first superhuman civil war in the comics, Robbie Baldwin was forever changed. The loss of civilian life and his team in the attack on Stamford left him traumatized. As such, his powers were altered so that he needed to feel pain to use them. He created a suit with 612 spikes inside it, basically an Iron Maiden superhero suit, each spike representing a life lost in the attack and he wore it all the time so that he could utilize his powers because he needed to feel the pain to use his powers. He also took up the name Penance and he became super moody. It was such a weird change, but it happened. Number three, Wonder Woman. This restriction actually does make sense when you consider what Wonder Woman is meant to represent thematically anyways, but at the same time, it certainly sounds ridiculous. So we're gonna include it. Wonder Woman is known for being one of the strongest heroes in DC Comics around, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that she doesn't have her own rules. She has to follow to maintain her power. Initially in the comics, if Wonder Woman was bound by a man, her entire power set lost to her like that, reducing her to human levels of strength and durability. She was a weakling. What I don't understand when it comes to that is that Wonder Woman has trained her entire life on Themyscira with the Amazons, right? So she would have muscles built in, right? So like, even if you take away her divine strength, wouldn't her physical strength be enough to just like, kind of like break through her bonds? I understand thematically why this was so, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about how Wonder Woman became such a skilled warrior and fighter. You know? Number two, Franklin Richards. Poor Franklin Richards. He was considered to be, for a while, one of the most powerful beings, potentially anyway, in all of the Marvel multiverse. That is, however, until his powers started to mysteriously go on the fritz. What's weird about this power restriction is it started as a glitch and then ended up fully leaving Franklin depowered which also apparently stripped him of his mutant status. Since we learned he was not naturally a mutant, but subconsciously was using his reality warping powers to make him appear as such. What's really odd though, is I don't think we even know why his powers were limited and then eventually lost. So this is a restriction that didn't even come with any explanation. Still a mystery as far as I know. Anyway, the only thing I know is it had to do with burnout from Franklin using his powers so much, but for a character who has been known by the codename Powerhouse, it's pretty disappointing that we still don't fully understand the power loss or see a path to how Franklin can get his powers back yet. Number one, Power Girl. Oh boy. Power Girl has a weird restriction when it comes to her invulnerability powers. She can't be harmed by really anything except natural materials. So I'm pretty sure that like her Atlantean heritage, which uh, was also a thing at some point in Power Girl's past, seriously, look it up, it exists. This restriction and weakness was also retconned out of existence, but there was a period in time where if Power Girl got into a fight and someone threw a stick or a stone at her hard enough, it really could break her bones as this was her one vulnerability for a while. Weird. Mm -hmm.